Now, there is the connection, the combination of Nietzsche and to see this is not entirely accidental and due to chance. I think I would like to say a few words about that. In one of his latest writings, The Dawn of Idols, Nietzsche said in a chapter which he entitled What I Owe to the Ancients, that he owed much more to the Latins than to the Greeks. And he is especially critical of Plato. And there occurs a sentence which I have quoted last year more than once. Plato is boring. The Platonic dialogue, he says, is terribly self-complacent and childish kind childlike kind of dialectics. Nietzsche's cure from all forms of Platonism was at all times Thucydides. Thucydides and perhaps the principle of Machiavelli are closest akin to him through the absolute will not to delude themselves and to see reason in reality and not in, quote, reason, unquote, and still less in, quote, morality. He goes on to say there, in Thucydides, the culture of the sophists, that's to say the culture of the realists, comes to its perfect expression. Courage in the face of reality to distinguishes in the last analysis such natures as Thucydides and Plato. Plato is a coward in the face of reality. Hence, he escapes into the ideal. Thucydides has control of himself. Hence, he has control of the things too, unquote, and therefore he doesn't have to escape into ideals. Now, the Thucydides is connected with a phenomenon known as sophistry. is today uh, very frequently said, and uh, one can easily make a case for that. Uh, Generally speaking, of course, the Soviets had a very bad press until about 1830 or so, when George Grote wrote his history of Greece and attacked Plato's critique of the Sophists. And that is a very sober piece of work culminating in one thesis, which I believe is unforgettable for anyone who has read Claude. And he says, if Plato is right against Sophists, then every member of parliament is a contemptible individual, which I think is what Plato meant, but which um, Claude regarded as a refutation of Plato. Uh, but Grote was a very sensible British radical, a utilitarian, and very far from the savagery which Nietzsche sometimes exhibits. But in, when Nietzsche takes the side of the Soviets, it means something very different from what it means when uh, Grote does it. Now, in order to puts a discussion of this great question to series and to service on proper basis, one would have, of course, not to rely on a traditional notion of sophistry, even if the root of the tradition is Plato, is Plato's own teaching, but one would have to form an independent judgment. And the best 
way to proceed, which I know, is to start from what Aristotle says about the sophist's political science. He says this towards the end of the Nicomachean Ethics. And according to Aristotle, the sophists thought that political science, the true political science, is more or less the same as the art of speaking, rhetoric. In other words, sophistry means a belief in the omnipotence of speech. And there is evidence, especially in Plato and the Gorgias, for example, uh, in support of this view. Now, it is perfectly sufficient to remember this point to see that Thucydides had very little to do with sophists, because his whole book is precisely an attempt to show the limitation of speech, that deed has principles of its own which cannot be reduced to those exhibited by speech. Now, these few remarks which I made give us already an answer to the question, which is, must be uppermost in our mind, since Thucydides presents himself for us in the first place as a historian. Is this a sound approach to Thucydides? to regard him as a historian. Now, Nietzsche's critique shows already that this is much too narrow a view of Thucydides. Of course, a man who writes it about the Peloponnesian War would be, and would be called a historian, and not only now, but for more than 2,000 years. But since there are n different ways of writing the history of a war, it is not much, uh, not to say much of a man that he is a, that he, by saying that he is a historian. What kind of historian, if this is a historian, is he? Now, I read to you uh, a remark of Nietzsche from Beyond Good and Evil, Aphorism 30 which uh, it will be of some help. Nietzsche says, our highest insights must and should sound like follies and sometimes like crimes when they are heard without permission by those who are not predisposed and predestined for them. The difference between the exoteric and the esoteric formerly known to philosophers, among the Indians as among the Greeks, Persians, and Muslims. In short, wherever one believed in an order of rank and not in equality and equal rights, does not so much consist in this that the exoteric approach comes from the outside and sees estimates, measures, and judges from the outside, not the inside. What is much more essential is that the exoteric approach sees things from below. The esoteric looks down from, ab from above. There are heights of the soul from which even tragedy ceases to look tragic and rolling together all, all the woe of the world, who could dare to decide whether its sight would necessarily seduce us and compel us to feel pity and thus double this woe? Now let us apply this to Sirius. To Sirius speaks of a number of outstanding men, the first man of the first outstanding man who comes to sight in his work 
is, as you will have seen, very close. And it is a perfectly defensible view to say Pericles is the, the perfect statesman as to see it as so on. But is this sufficient? Does this reveal us, reveal to us, to see this view of statesmanship and therefore in particular also of the art of peace and war. Let me use a simile. When there is a variety of mountains whose peaks are hidden by clouds and the men in the valley see all these mountains as equally high, because they don't see the peaks. That is a way in which to see this presents this man, only with this difference, that he is not a man in the valley, and that he may indicates in his way, which is not always easy to follow, the subtle differences between the various men of the first rank, men like Pericles. And it's the task of the student of, the serious student of Thucydides is to find out how Thucydides judged of these various men of the first order he discusses. Now, I do not know whether I made clear this point. So when Thucydides praises Pericles, he never blames him. It does this mean that he is identifies himself, his point of view, with that of Pericles? Or are, does he have any reservations? That is a question which we would have to face sooner or later, rather sooner, because we have now reached the point where Pericles enters the stage. <laughs>